It was another mass shooting tragedy that tore at the soul of our nation. Now the Stoneman Douglas students are vowing to make sure it never happens again. But can they succeed where so many others have failed? Every single person up here today, all these people should be at home grieving. But instead, we are up here, standing together, because if all our government and president can do is send thoughts and prayers, then it's time for victims to be the change that we need to see. The brave speech by high school senior Emma Gonzalez struck the conscience of the country and ignited the Never Again March for Our Lives movement created by her and her fellow students. We've had too many debates before, and we've gotten nowhere. We need a discussion where we hear both sides. From the Republicans, they can talk about mental health care, and from the Democrats, they can talk about gun control. The teens took to the streets, the State House, and anywhere people would listen. All this in between funerals for the 17 students and staff murdered at their school in Parkland, Florida. It's a healthy response, says Dr. Randy Sconyers. And at that age group, they're very resilient. So you can see those kids that were talking out were very strong. They were tough. They were using that trauma and turning it into something that could actually help change. And I call that transform transformational pain. When you experience pain, but then you use it to change things in your environment. Teen actress Don Shea Hopkins played the daughter of Ghost on the hit series Power. Her character, Raina, was gunned down outside school. She sees the debate over the Florida teen's strong anti-gun stance as a positive. I think they're doing an amazing job and they're doing what they have to do because it's like controversy, it causes action. And if you, you can't just sit down and say, well, I don't want this to happen anymore. You have to stand up and you have to try and make a change and you have to talk to your local politicians and you have to go to Washington. You do have to talk to these really important people. For younger children, unavoidable images of the tragedy can be overwhelming and impossible to ignore. So encourage conversations, say the experts. They will really be careful about the information they share based on the age of the kids as well. You don't want to scare your kids, but you want to educate them. I let them know there's people out there that try to do harm sometimes. Uh, here's what to look out for. Here's what to do in these type of situations. Here to, here's how to react. Here's how to respond. Uh, so that way they're prepared. They're not, you know, deer in headlights. Oh my God, what, what's going on? While the current generation of teens is sometimes seen as too passionate and unwilling to listen to adults, it could be their key to success as they take on the NRA, the White House, and anyone in their way, says Sconyers. Because they had those attitudes, they're willing to go against the grain. And if we have to, we'll go against the adults who are not making any changes. So that same thing that was considered the bad parts of this generation, we're seeing now this is actually the strengths of this generation. Once again, America's unresolved issues about guns and mental health are begging for answers. Let's find out what our panel has to say. Joining me is uh, Patrick McCall. He's a CEO of the McCall Risk Group and also a security consultant. Pat, great to have you with us on the show. Thanks for having me, Lisa. Thank you. Also with us is Dr. Darren Porcher. He's a former NYPD lieutenant, a law enforcement analyst, and a criminal justice professor. Darren, great to have you with us. Thank it's you. It's always a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Also with us is Dr. Randy Sconyers. He's a clinical therapist. He's owner of New Steps Counseling Services and founder of the Mental Hop Program, a mental health program using hip hop. Randy, great to have you with us. Thanks, Lisa, for having thank, me. Thank you so much. Darren, I want to start with you. When you look at this tragedy, we've heard before so many times, never again, never again, and yet it keeps happening. Why does this keep happening? Well, oftentimes, one of the first things that I hear is, you know, first, my heart goes out to the victims in Florida. And one of the things that we look at is we look at what happened to Sandy Hook um, just a couple of years ago with the Adam, Adam Lanza situation. And then now we translate that same experience of gun violence to what happened in Florida. One of the first things that I see is people use gun control as an antiseptic to possibly decreasing um, the violence in schools in connection with firearms use. But the truth of the matter is there's a far more constant, comprehensive strategy that's involved. We need to look at a lot of the environmental aspects such as um, socioeconomics, mental health, and education. We want to triangula triangulate those three components to come up with a more plausible solution. As so you're saying gun, we really don't gun, know uh, why. Gun reform. Are, so, so basically you're saying we really don't know why no, this happens. No, I disagree. I think that we do know. The problem is it's become such a partisan issue whereas you have op opposing views from Democrats and Republicans. And when we look at legislation that's being introduced, it's making it more of a problematic situation. Let me talk about the students first of all. Uh, Dr. Randy, you work with students. You work with students who have gone through various types of trauma, especially in our urban communities. What kind of effect does going through something like this have on somebody who's 14, 15, 16 years old as as many of these students are. 
Well, first of all, I want to send my condolences to the to the students and the victims as well. And right away, what you start to see is this um, sorrow that's taking place. The kids become hypervigilant, and they actually become more sensitive to uh, some of the traumas that they're facing. And in this case, we had that fight or flight reaction, and these kids are responding by fighting back. They want change. So what we'll see is it impacts the kids that were directly in the classrooms, but kids that went to schools in neighboring areas and also across the country. Cause social media this this case has kind of taken hold and the kids are scared I really believe that and then in terms of the reaction because there some people even though I think personally it's totally inappropriate to judge how somebody else grieves or mm -hmm. deals with mm -hmm. a trauma they did come under fire by some people in the media and on social media saying why are they becoming so active and doing all of this in between funerals for their friends and their mm -hmm. classmates is that what what's your assessment of that what well, are stages of grief right so one of the stages of grief is anger so what you see in that anger is really a, a, a reflection of really what's passion these kids are passionate and they want change they're tired of these issues that are taking place so it's not it's not abnormal to see kids respond in that kind of way I think what you're seeing is it's a, it's a movement of the kids doing it collectively and I think that's what's kind of taking people and really off. touching pe uh, people's hearts and their oh, consciences yeah. I think eloquent and talking and speaking you know being on television shows and giving their perspectives in a really uh, intelligent way so a lot of people it's, are it's having an it. impact definitely Pat we always talk about the this always comes back to the guns and once again it's a, an assault type rifle or an AR-15 semi-automatic stop me if I'm incorrect here and it's the same type of gun that is not really used for self-protection is not used for hunting is not used for any lawful activity except to kill as many people as possible in the shortest amount of time am I am I right about that I agree with you I think uh, you know I'm pro guns um, I support it however I, I firmly believe uh, that there's no reason a 19 year old a 30 year old a 50 year old um, has a need for an AR-15 uh, there's no legitimate need uh, other than some targeting practice. Uh, targeting practice. Um, it, it's different for me in my line of work, uh, security. Um, you know, it's a requirement. It's, it's a tool, uh, being a handgun or, or a gun for certain types of work. Uh, but a lot of these other rifles uh, that are out there and a lot of these other guns that are out there, they serve no legitimate purpose. And then in terms of the availability of it, because there, the argument has been like, why should why should a 19-year-old be able to legally buy an AR-15 like you would go buy a pair of sneakers? Well, that's the problem I have as well. So Florida, basically, three days, you walk into a store, you purchase a handgun, you got to wait three days for an approval. Um, this gentleman could, could, in theory, have walked into a store, purchased his gun in as little 60 seconds. Uh, a background check, as they call it, came back, authorized him to then walk out of the store. So within minutes, he walked out of the store with an AR-15, but he couldn't walk out with a handgun. So there's some troubling uh, issues there. So it was even easier to get that than just a regular handgun? Absolutely. With, within a matter of minutes, he was able to purchase this, this firearm and, and walk out of the store. And why is that? Can you help us understand what the, the gun lobby rationed? I, I mean, the, the, the gun law vary state by state. Uh, obviously, as we know, New York is, is very strict. Uh, a lot of states like Florida, Arizona, uh, Vermont, uh, Arkansas are very lenient. Uh, a lot of states don't even require you to have a permit to purchase the gun. It doesn't require you to even register that gun. Um, and a lot of times we see those guns ending up in, in other states where the laws are a little bit more, more strict. And, and a lot of the guns used in crimes in New York City, the NYPD tells us, come from these other states. But Darren, in terms of the accessibility of it, why do we even need these guns and these AR-15s or these assault rifles in our society? Well, that's been a that's a question people want. That's been a subjective, subjective point that's been come up for years and years and years on end. Um, the truth of the matter is, as Patrick, my counterpart, mentioned that you do have people that may choose to use this for target practice. You do have collectors may, that may deem to own this. You may also have people that may want to use this as a line of self-defense in their homes. Um, so it's really very difficult for me to assess as to why so people wait, should have you're, it. So you're going to be sleep, you're sleeping, you hear a sound no, but, downstairs, but, but, and you're going to pull out the, well, well, set I think, up the tripod and pull out the sniper I gun think, and sure. I think people I mean, have a right to protect themselves in a society uh, police departments I want to say law enforcement are not affording the public the protections that they feel that they need but at the same token these weapons are now I I emitting from not just the home but they're getting into schools they're getting into public facilities and they're causing massive carnage so now we have to look at what is the concept of law enforcement or I want to say the federal government doing to protect us well, as, I want to talk citizens. about that I want to talk about the federal government. I also want to talk about the students and the kids and the impact, and, and some of the schools are hiring armed guards. We're going to talk about that. This is Street Soldiers. I'm your host, Lisa Evers. We'll be right back. He was labeled as being low risk. 
So when you have a mental health issue along with having firearms, how can he be low risk? Right away, he should have been labeled as being high risk. What is the difference between semi-automatic and automatic, and where did these guns come from? So basically the M16 was originally designed for the military uh, as a fully automatic weapon, the AR-15, I'm gonna kinda call it as a, a spin-off uh, civilian use uh, that is semi-automatic. And then when, when they say semi-automatic versus automatic, in terms of damage it can do or bullets, what is uh, the difference? I, I, obviously both guns can, can do, uh, you know, a lot of damage. Uh, Semi-automatic basically requires a, a trigger pull each time, opposed to a fully automatic, basically you just pull the trigger once and, and hold it down. And bullets just keep coming out? Correct. As many bullets as you have in the magazine? Correct. Up to about how many? Uh, it depends, 30 round magazines. Um, sometimes box fed uh, can shoot even more so so it's conceivable that this the suspect in this Parkland uh, massacre he's pulling the trigger every time Correct. he's firing mm -hmm. on the air 15 Darren in terms of the guns why do we even need that type of a gun in the, in, in a quote-unquote civilized society well I'm speaking as a prior army officer and while I trained in the military we use what we refer, we use an m16 which is a fully automatic version and it's really interesting and I understand the dynamic of an 18 year old being able to possess a weapon because we as a country we draft people to come in and shoot and train with an m16 weapon but then at the same token we these people leave the military and they should have a right to acquire the weapons that they've used in the military but at the same time token there needs to be provisions in play there needs to be an aspect of gun control we need to have backgrounds checks we need to have a mental health check and there needs to be an overall assessment of those, of those people I think it has to do with us having too many guns and, and a perpetuation of violence in this country where we use violence to resolve issues all the time so as the more guns that we have that's the go-to method in a lot of times to resolve conflicts, unfortunately. And it stops at the t it starts at the top. So it trickles down to our kids as well. And a lot it's of times- It's more of a social issue. I, not to cut Boy, you let off, me, but let me just, the social dynamics of this country dictate that, hey, look, when you have a problem, you utilize violence to extinguish what your issue is. And that's one I mentioned earlier about the three components, education, mental health, and socioeconomics. Well, let, the well, education piece is very important. And I'm gonna let you lead well, back let me talk. Talk about the mental health piece because I, I do want to talk about education. Yep. We're we'll talk about gun education and also safety education yep. as well. But let, let's talk about the mental health piece. We look at this suspect, this 19-year-old suspect. People look at him and go, "You could just tell by looking at him." Even though most mug shots are pretty, you know, bad to begin with. Sure. And, and just you know, it's the least flattering picture of the person ever, and probably the worst, one of the worst moments of their life. Mm -hmm. He looks disturbed in the mm -hmm. picture. He just, he just looks, he just doesn't look like he's in his. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. He just doesn't look like he's there, like totally detached in any picture. So is there a certain profile? You know, we, we saw with Sandy Hook, that shooter, he was very detached from, from society. He was mm -hmm. isolated. He was binging on very the most violent video games that were out at the time. He would have never is received there... the weapon. His mother trained him. Adam Lanza's mother trained him how to fire that weapon. He in no way, shape, or form had the ability to acquire a weapon Right, legally. but I'm talking about the mental health profile. So is there a sure. mental health profile? So he profile? illegally used that weapon. So mental health is not a direct correlation with obviously going and shooting up schools. So there's people, and that, I want to say that right off the bat. Right, because there's plenty of people that have mental, that health, mental health issues, issues that, that are not Violent. That's right. But so, there, what about that small percentage, which is a minority, right? Well, that small that are violent. That small percentage. That's where we need those safeguards. I think there was a lot of balls that were dropped. He was labeled as being low risk. So when you have a mental health issue along with having firearms, how can he be low risk? Right away, he should have been labeled as being high risk. <laughs> Let me ask you this, in terms of the assessment mm -hmm. of the suspect, of the this gunman, mm -hmm. His, he was. There were a lot of encounters. There mm -hmm. were social workers there. There mm -hmm. were calls to the police department. From a mental health perspective, what point does it stop becoming a red flag and it becomes like a 911, like an intervention? Something has to be done. Well, there were several factors. Uh, this young man started cutting um, at the uh, breakup with his with his girlfriend. He also was diagnosed with depression, ADHD, and autism. 
as well on top of some challenges in terms of domestic violence so when you do a psychiatric screening we send kids out to the hospital or youth to go to the hospital they have to be screened that um, screener actually asks the, the certain questions in terms of being a danger to self or others now that screening is not always you know, it could be different for each clinician in terms of how they feel. So and it's that's more a subjective? It's a, a little bit more subjective, and I think that's a problem in itself. But even before that, there's a problem in the education system in terms of stigma around mental health. So, because if you heard a lot of the kids afterwards, they said they could sense something wasn't right. And that's because no one wants to speak out because you don't want to hurt the person's feelings, you don't want to judge them. But if we can make mental health just like if you have a broken leg or you had something wrong with you, we would talk about it without feeling like you're judging someone. And I think that's where we have to get back to that education piece, where mental health is something similar to our physical health. It can't be something that we talk about after a shooting. It needs to be something that so we talk me, so about. So let me make sure I'm understanding. That we so talk about so, all so, the so time. what you're saying is this assessment of some of a student who can, of, of a, a teen or even an adult, but we're talking about the school situation. This assessment of a student can be totally subjective on the part. Of of whatever clinician is doing it, depending on whatever their bias is, if they have an anti-law enforcement bias, you're supposed they to don't want to have the biases. child criminal. You don't want the child criminalized. Experience, how much experience do you have as a clinician doing the doing the screening? All those all those things are important. But this thing is like an assembly line. Let's call it what it is. They get people in ten minutes and they get them out. One person comes in. What's your issue? Okay, you're looking to kill yourself. No. All right. Next, we push him out. The next person comes in. That's this is not a always byproduct, the case. But this is the byproduct of the HMOs. This is, I, I'll tell you, as a police That's officer in the NYPD, I can't tell you how many people that I, we, I brought into these emergency rooms that we saw as as emotionally disturbed persons. That could hurt that somebody. Came in, that, it, that these could. are people that, for whatever the case may have been, we bring them in, they go in for a 10-minute quick assessment, and, and then they go on. The only way that you can conduct a credible assessment of someone from a mental health perspective is you need to watch them in their environment. And that's not what's happening. It's just merely a question and answer block and you get them moving forward. But Pat, what about this? Because there's no, it, it, it's, I mean, we always come back even, w w there's there have been so many issues over the last couple years where there's been a very a very significant mental health component mm -hmm. and there's no real uh, c consistent, mm -hmm. reliable intervention strategy except for people to call 911 and then police arrive on the scene not knowing what they're walking into, not, not knowing if the person has a butcher knife as we've seen, a gun, mm -hmm. you know, whatever in these kind of situations. What do you think about this fact that these clinicians can just make these these subjective assessments I, I think it's also a training piece um, you know the fact that matter is uh, as I went back to the original analogy uh, 10 minutes uh, as Darren said sitting down with somebody um, you know basically uh, a lot of times these people are gonna tell you what you want to hear or what they need to, to get out of that office and they um, kind of know if they've already been through it right they're, they're, not gonna, they, they're gonna roll with things. the punches go through you know they're not gonna say certain things uh, as Randy said they're gonna basically tell you what you want to hear and they're gonna move on and a lot of times we hear about these you know warning signs oh well this is a warning sign and it goes back to people not reporting it and not following up. But every and warning sign was here and people did call. Let's talk about solutions. Pat, some schools are putting armed guards in the schools. What do you think about that? I think um, I think a big thing is, is communication. Um, a lot of schools are trying to be proactive uh, at this point, so adding armed guards, uh, smart cameras, uh, door locks, um, and other security protocols to try to combat um, any potential uh, you know, incidents. What do you think about the armed guard idea? I think it's a smart idea. Uh, unfortunately, there's a time of, uh, you know, that we're in, um, whether it be a school shooting or another sort of disturbance. Um, I think it's important if the people are trained properly. I think training uh, is an important element of that. Darren, what do you think about the armed guard idea? Remember, there was an armed guard in this school when this happened. So apparently the on card didn't work. I think you need the proper amount of personnel there. So you need to look at the schematic of personnel in comparison to the security that you have on the ground. That's the security solution to ensuring that you have this public and um, the school is protected accordingly. <laughs>